Well, a good Saturday morning. Hello, one and all. We are back in studio. Myself, Brian Maine. We've got, uh, let's see, Tiger Palafox and, of course, John Bagnasco. Welcome to the weekend. Hope you had a good week. And uh, as we wrap up this weekend, or to this weekend, don't forget tonight, officially at 2 a.m., but I guess you can do it before you go to bed. Set your clocks ahead. We're going to spring forward. And I do want to make this mention for the first time in 20 years, John did not put the daylight savings time in the newsletter. Tiger? No, I I think that he didn't do it last year at some point in time, too. If I really? Remember, I thought I remember having this conversation before that he hmm. messed up. Did you miss twice? <laughs> did you miss twice, Bunky? <laughs> I don't recall missing twice. <laughs> But it's possible. Anyway, Anything's daylight possible. savings time begins, you know, they say officially at 2 a.m. I don't know what the deal is with Didn't that. Didn't we vote a couple years ago to, to have daylight savings time year-round? To evaluate it. We voted to evaluate it. And that's that's, how, that's kinda, how we do things here in California. It just went away. <laughs> I like the states that don't even have it. Yeah. And parts of Indiana, I think. Some parts have it. Some parts don't. Hawaii. I don't think Arizona. Hawaii doesn't have it. Hawaii. There's so, no need to, to have it in Hawaii. Right. Because the closer you are to a, the equator, it There's doesn't no change. change. <laughs> 12 hours <laughs> in the morning, 12 hours at night. Are the Hawaiian Islands the most um, isolated islands in the world? In other no. words, further away from anywhere from northeast, west, or south? No. You sure about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you you got to be careful when John says yeah. yes or no with conviction, because there's usually more to it. What about? But you're very convincing, by the way. Well, what about St. Helena? I would think that's probably, it's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's closer to Africa, though, isn't it? Or Spain no, or Portugal? it's right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, we have to research that. Halfway between the old world and the new world. You know, one of our viewers or listeners are, are going to chime in that, that yeah. are very good geographically and explain this to us. Well, that's the hard thing about maps, right? Is, you know, the maps we look at that we're accustomed to looking at aren't always in proportion to what it should be, you know, in right, size right, of right. continents, location and stuff. So, you know, people look at the map and see Hawaii be like, oh, yeah, it's in the middle of nowhere. But meanwhile, you know, who knows? The Atlantic Ocean might be bigger, but it looks smaller on our map. And like you're saying, maybe something in the middle of the Atlantic is actually farther away from things. Than well, the, the Pacific, Pacific Ocean is the largest ocean. So, you know, but maybe Hawaii is in the middle, farthest from everything then. Yeah. If, if you look at Hawaii, though, it is almost right in the middle between North America and... What is that, Japan on the other Japan, side? Japan, Asia, that side of the continent. Yeah. And then you've got Tahiti, which is to but the isn't, south. Isn't Guam close to there? Well, they're all, all the Midway Island, Easter Island, Guam. Yeah, they're all those islands in the yeah, Pacific. So but I think, it... I think Hawaii is more in the middle. Oh, I thought you meant the most remote from anything. Yeah. Not from other I islands. You were That's why too. I said St. Helena. Um, anyway, we can... Are we going to do gardening today, or are we going to do geography? A little bit of both. Okay, good. Anyway, yeah. well, we do have, you know... Your uh, gardening depends on your geography. And plant material yeah. does grow in Hawaii and on St. Helena, John, right? It does. So there you, <laughs> so there you go. And, and our topic today is food security. That's right. And this is episode two, by the way, of avocados. <laughs> yeah. Right. And unlike last week, we have a guest today. <laughs> yep. Exciting. At a Just, boy, Tiger. Justin's going to be joining us this morning. I got it all set up. And you know, a lot of people on Facebook are saying good morning. Uh, good morning, Blossom Valley. Rochelle. Carla says good morning, Huntington Beach. Carolyn. Sunny in, uh, where is she, John? CDM, California? Yeah. Canyon Country. No, Corona Del Mar. Corona Del Mar. Right. Okay. Thank you. Newport Beach area. So, welcome one and all. We're going to be talking we avocados once King again. from Tucson. Gina yep. from Meridian, Meridian, Idaho. Rick from Star, Idaho. You know, Tucson is a growing uh, place for us in terms of viewership. Got a couple of people now dialed in this morning from Tucson. Yeah, Tucson is, uh, they're right in the middle of spring, right? Yeah, you would think so. Yeah, same with the uh, the desert areas in mm -hmm. California. You know, like Palm Desert, uh, Palm, Palm Springs. Springs Cathedral uh, Rancho City. Mirage. Yeah. Uh, Frank Sinatra Boulevard. <laughs> Frank Sinatra. Coachella? Who, no, who was the... Bob Hope. Bob Palm, Hope big, Drive. Big Palm Springs guy. Yeah, his house is, have you been to Palm Springs, seen his house yep. up on the hill there? It's like, yep. you know, you know what's interesting about Bob Hope is that you think he made a lot of money in entertainment, which he did. He was a real estate mogul. Really? He made his money in real estate. I guess his brother was a realtor or was in real estate. So he bought land everywhere. So. Good move. All right. Let's see. So you're going to be uh, trimming roses today, right, John? 
I have people from the California Coastal Rose Society coming over. They're going to help. You're, because I, I love that. I've got people. Yeah. <laughs> I've got people. He's got people. But I need things. people. I only have a thousand roses pruned, which sounds like a lot, but I'm still I still have another five hundred to go. <laughs> Tanya says good morning from San Jose. Good morning. Tanya. Welcome, San Jose. And Sue's got a question right off the bat. Planting tomatoes today need a bag of soil. What do you recommend? She planting them in a pot or in the ground? Yeah, yeah pot if, ground. If they're in a container, use either 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 or either uh fox farm happy frog or um ocean forest one wonderful soils wonderful yeah you, you just, can't go wrong with either you open one that of those. bag and all the heat comes out yeah and then you stick as your far hands as putting in there, aspirin in the hole because she's wondering whether to do that our our late friend steve goto always would recommend putting two aspirin in the hole one on each side of the plant and that the does... university studies that have been done with that uh, were crushing the aspirin, dissolving it in and water, water, and then watering, and then watering it. it in. And she says both pots and in the ground. Okay. Yeah. Well, the two soils we recommended were for in containers, mm -hmm. and then for in the ground. If you want to use some mulch, you can. I don't know if it's that important. Yeah, it just depends on to, your soil, right? And... If it's a heavy doing. clay soil, you probably want to work some organic material mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. And if it's not heavy clay, just use organic fertilizers. Or if you've got some compost you want to work in there, that would be good, too. Gina's tulips are just starting to peak. Oh, that's but, exciting. She's back, excited. Back yeah, to the so aspirin, though. Why it, Aspirin is uh, yeah, what acetamed, is an, what acetamed acetamed aspirin, acetamed? right? Acetaminophen? Aspirin, right? Acetosalicylic acid. So what does that do to the tomato that you would want to put that in the soil. Yeah, what is the benefit of that, John? Well, salicylic acid is uh, released when plants think that they're under attack. Um, and some plants have larger sources of it, like willows, uh, which is where I think aspirin originally came from. But when the plants um, think they're under attack, and that's what spraying them with the aspirin would do, they put out hormones to fend off the attack, and those hormones uh, increase the vita vitality of the plant, so it increases flowers and fruit production. Okay, and probably protection Right, like from if, bugs. You, if you do it with roses, you can get about 20% more blooms. Oh. I think I could take a test on that now Yeah, and get a B, B+. Plus. <laughs> John's hard. <laughs> And yeah. he does not. He, he doesn't grade on a curve. On a curve, he does he not. He doesn't. It's a. Nope. It's a. You know, straight you know, what up. Was Those were lazy. You know, the teachers. last time I was grading, <laughs> uh, I was teaching at Palomar College, and I told my students, "You know what? If you just if you just come to class, I promise I'll pass you." <laughs> and they couldn't do that. Oh yeah. You know what I liked, and people thought it was a dumb idea, but I th I think it's brilliant. Open book tests, because it forces you. You have one hour. Here's yeah. the test. Here's the book. Look it up. Because you have to look it up to get the answer. Yeah. It's like doing your homework you're in class. Learning and taking at a test. At the same on it. time. You're yeah. you're forced and oh, I got the book right here. I can do it. I think yeah. it's good motivation. John yeah. would never go for that though. When I took his Latin class, he put the kibosh on that. <laughs> all I could ever say or learn was E pluribus unum. That's it. It's all you're, I did. You're a money guy, that's why. We did that. Uh, we used to have Latin yeah. lessons. I did all I did pretty you good. You did, you learned a lot. I lost interest after. Yeah. Or you lost interest in teaching me. I'm not sure. Hey, that. let's do the quote of the week. We've got avocados on our mind today. And uh, Justin's going to be our guest. Justin West is going to be our guest from Thrive Lot. And he'll be joining us to talk about food security. And so we're talking about growing avocados, but at the same time, the importance of growing our own food. Right. You know who introduced the avocado into the United States? David Fairchild. And I think David's this, got today's quote, doesn't and he? And this quote is from him. And David said that the avocado is a food without rival among the fruits, the veritable fruit of paradise. <laughs> I keep thinking of your first bad experience, you and your mother, though, with avocado. Yeah. <laughs> just back a, in Michigan. Just completely r unripened, hard Now, avocado. do you put avocado in your salad now and then? Yeah. Oh, I, I, always. I would, always. If, it's a staple of salad. If I could have an avocado all the time, I would eat it all the time. I have no problem avocado everything 
on salads, on burgers. Do you have an sandwiches. avocado tree at your house? I do. What yes. kind? Um, Holiday? No. Little cuddle? No. It's a it's a big one. I think it's a bacon, if bacon? I remember correctly. Yeah. So. You're warm enough that you could have yeah. other trees, right? Yeah. Oh, for sure. It's more of a space thing. I have it kind of really towards the back because I want it to be big. Mm -hmm. I want it to be a big tree. So um, maybe I'll get a dwarf one too. But it, I don't know. I was looking at, as I mentioned before, I like the Pinkerton. But then there was one last week, and I can't remember the name. And I'm like, ooh, that might be interesting to have. We're going to take a break, our first break of the day. Uh, those on BizTalk Radio, thank you for tuning in. Thank you to Stephanie and the gang keeping us on the air at the network. So, again, they're going to take a break, going to bring uh, our guest on, Justin, talking about avocados. So those on Facebook Live, questions, comments. And uh, here we go with another edition of Garden America for your weekend. Back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. And just like that, we are back from the break here. Biz Talk Radio, Facebook Live. Thank you for tuning in. As I look at Facebook, a lot of people tuned in for this one. I think last week was a bit of a tease in terms of uh, talking about avocados. We're going to do it today again with uh, our guest, Justin Avocados, Episode 2. Tiger, it's all yours. Yeah, so this morning we have Justin West, the uh, co-founder of Thrive Lot, an edible landscaping platform that transforms traditional yards into beautiful edible landscapes. And Justin has joined us on the program before and explained what right. you know Thrive Lot's uh, goal was or is, and um, you know today, you know taking that one step further into kind of our food security because, you know, in today's time we're dealing with shortages and not just on food but all kinds of other products. But but food is obviously one of those things we cannot survive without. So, um, Justin, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be back, guys. Excited to, uh, well, excited and, and you know, um, a little, uh, a little scared, a little yeah. sad to talk about this, but, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's really, it's really important and, uh, and, and pressing, pressing issue in the world today. Yeah. So, Justin, um, remind our listeners a little bit about Thrive Lot. Your guys' goal is to, bring gardening to or bring vegetables and fruits and edible plants to local communities. Um, but in which way, how are you guys trying to uh, achieve that goal? Yeah, that's right. You know, the, the original, uh, the original vision, the original inspiration for Thrive Lot was just looking at the world about seven years ago and saying, you know, the, the, the fundamental risk to, um, human life globally is, is, is food. I mean, no, no matter where a threat comes from, if it's war, if it's, uh, uh pestilence, you know, if it's a, if it's a pandemic, uh, if it's some sort of economic crash, the real problem, what can really, really, um, hurt people and, and what historically has caused some of the, you know, just, just the most horrifying stories is the fact, that, you know, things fall apart and, and people can't get food. Um, and, and so Thrive Lot was really founded with a mission to hyper-localize, truly sustainable food production. And, and I like to say you don't have truly sustainable food production outside of an ecosystem, an ecosystem being biodiverse with healthy soil, with uh, plants that build that soil, with, with insects uh, of a, a, a variety, a diversity of insects, um, a true ecosystem, and uh, and and I was really inspired, and we've taken a lot of inspiration from permaculture and and similar similar disciplines that basically mimic uh, natural systems to put the right plant in the right place to develop the soil so that it's going to catch and hold the most water, so that it's going to uh, 
work with the plants in the place that we put them. And, um, and, and there's, there's a lot of indigenous uh, knowledge around this. Um, there, are, uh, there are a lot of other schools of uh, education outside of permaculture specifically. But, um, but ultimately what we do is we find homeowners, property owners, people that want sustainable food production or that just want you know, to, to have a positive environmental impact with a pollinator garden, uh, for example, and want to improve their property value. And then we connect them with local experts in creating ecosystems and in growing food. And we give, uh, we, we built a technology platform that connects both parties, both the, the local expert and the customer, and uh, has a lot of useful tools for assessing the ecology of the site beginning to create a concept plan and a design uh, for the space, and then uh, actually planning, quoting, estimating, and uh, installing, and then eventually maintaining these these productive natural spaces. Yeah, and I mean, you know, as we started off the interview, we specifically talked about avocados, and, you know, but one of the things you kind of mentioned is finding out what it is in your region that would grow um, you know, kind of almost on their own, you know, you mentioned water right. and you mentioned weather that, you know, these plants that you are going to suggest aren't just going to be foods that maybe people want, but actually are going to thrive in your specific region, um, yeah. which is an important part of it. All right. Justin, as far yeah. as like, you're talking about the ecology, you're talking about the pollinization of it. You need to find things that are going to work with where you're at. And not everybody kind of realizes that, these plants don't grow everywhere. That's right. And, and, you know, on the on the flip side of that, there are thousands of what I call lost species of just amazing native, perennial, beautiful, edible, medicinal plants that have been lost. Um, you know, for, for much, much of the United States, the pawpaw is an amazing fruit. It'll grow all the way up into Ohio, New York. I mean, it's, uh, it's an amazing tropical fruit that escaped the tropics that almost nobody has ever eaten <laughs> since, <laughs> since uh, uh, the 20th century. century. And um, there, are, there are thousands of examples like that um, that, uh, that, that we can bring back and that we can, um, we can utilize to create healthy, hyper-localized food. Um, and avocados are great. You know, you're in, in California, you're in Florida, um, and let's, let's grow some avocados. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you're going to need a greenhouse pretty much anywhere else in the country if you want them. It's funny, you mentioned Papa. The only thing I know of Papa is my wife buys this, like, uh, chapstick that's pawpaw based I was like, I, I didn't realize it was an edible fruit, too. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, you know we've got we've got folks in our network that have been selectively breeding pawpaws even for twenty years, and I mean this is this kind of stuff gets me so excited. Just the uh, the, the level of of depth uh, that we can kind of nerd out on re- restoring these valuable species. Um, there's a there's a guy that we work with, Doug Crouch in Ohio, Trio Permaculture, just the nicest guy ever. Um, he has been crossbreeding pawpaws for 20 years for taste and yield and uh, has one that, uh, that's, that's a mango flavored and has one that's <laughs> like, a, like a vanilla ice cream flavor. I mean, it's, a, it's just amazing. But, oh, that's so <laughs> funny. It's, it, it sounds like pawpaw is like the uh, tofu of the, uh, that, the fruit world there where you can just kind of create one that makes into any flavor that you want. That's pretty... It's, it's, it's pretty cool. We've got we've got uh, we've got a guy here in Tennessee that is breeding um, uh, elderberry. You know, elderberry delicious syrups you can make from it. Uh, amazing, amazing uh, uh, antioxidizing health benefits. Uh, grows grows native across much of the United States. Uh, grows really well. There's a guy here who is uh, selectively breeding a specific variety of elderberry to uh, repair erosion on hillsides. So. Mm. He's, he's using a process to find out the uh, or, to, or to select the genetics that do well on barren hillsides, um, and there's just <laughs> just so much so much that we can do with uh, with native perennial plants that uh, also can produce medicine and food all around us that um, is there if we need it, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it's neat to get a, get a purpose as well. Bit of trivia. <laughs> 
There's a town in Michigan called Pawpaw. Really? Yeah. Is it is it because they grow pawpaw? pawpaw up they there? do grow. I believe they do grow. Up there. <laughs> they're they're That's used, likely the northern stretch. <laughs> there used to be a uh, outfielder for the Detroit Tigers called uh, Charlie Maxwell, and his nickname was Pawpaw. It was Charlie Pawpaw Maxwell. Wow! <laughs> Always hit a home run on Sunday. Yeah. No, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Only on Sundays, though. Yeah. That's right. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, and, and, you know, talked about the selective breeding. Uh, we've talked about this a, a few times, so I don't want to expand on it too much. But, you know, John, we had uh, tomato mania last week. And one of the things that they're doing with tomatoes is that dwarf, you know, the, the Tasmanian uh, chocolate. Right. You know, is part of a series where they're selectively breeding small bush tomatoes right. that actually produce fruit. Um, but that gives people the ability to grow these vegetables wherever they are in, in smaller yeah. areas in smaller areas right containers or small gardens so Love it. so it is fun to geek out on that kind of stuff where you know people are taking mm -hmm. specific edible plants and hopefully making them work wherever i mean you know maybe one day we'll have a uh, michigan avocado john <laughs> Not a lot of evergreen trees in Michigan, except for conifers. Yeah. No, no. I'll tell you what. If you if you really really want it, you got to really want it, and you got to have the budget. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, you install the you install the right greenhouse and uh, and set it up with uh, enough heating. You can you can have avocados pretty much anywhere. You know, uh, cashews. Uh, a lot of tropical. Yeah. Set up your uh, your tropical uh, terrarium and uh, and make it work. But. Uh, Hey, I think that's uh, hey, prohibitive. Justin, um, you know, with, with the food security, I mean, you know, us coming from San Diego, it's a little bit different. I mean, San Diego County is one of the largest concentrations of small farms, food farms in the country. Um, so, you know, we get a, a wide variety of crops year round. Um, but elsewhere where they don't have that, the... I mean, we're getting into the time of year, right, where, you know, people are planting, spring is going to get started, and then in a few months, you know, your your best food sources are going to be the local farmer's market. And is that one way that you suggest supporting some of these small farms? How do you, how do you suggest kind of, you know, it, yeah, growing your own is great, but then if you don't grow your own, what are some other ways that people can support? Absolutely, absolutely. The closer, the closer to your door that you can source food, the better. And, um, and, and what you're doing, uh, you know, I like, I, I like to say that you vote, you actually vote with your attention and with your dollars, right? <laughs> we, we, we select and we feed what we want to see in the world by uh, how we apply our attention and our money. And uh, farmers markets uh, join a CSA, you know, community supported agriculture. Um, there, I, I guarantee you, no matter how small your town might be, and, and definitely around the big metro cities, there are small farmers all around you that are setting up community-supported agriculture systems that are going to the farmers markets, and, um, and 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 you should absolutely tap into those. And and same with meat. Um, believe it or not, there's uh, there, there's there's plenty of local meat options. You have to look for them. You know, there's no great um, centralized place. There are there are a few websites that are starting to um, that are starting to sort of aggregate some farmers markets and, and local farms, that sort of thing. Um, and I, I've got a list of this somewhere I can, can share, I can share with you guys to share with your listeners later, but, um, um, definitely seek out that, that localized food as, as, um, you are then investing in your local food production infrastructure, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's just, <laughs> and, you, you, uh, you, I believe the average, the average meal in the United States, the average calorie Travels about thirteen hundred miles from where wow. it was it was grown, and the actual production, the the fossil fuel based machinery, the fossil fuel based uh, chemical agriculture with the fertilizers and and pesticides, and then the transportation, um, it's about thirteen calories of energy burned for every one calorie delivered to people, and then of course we know about 40% of that food is wasted. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, uh, you know, we, I think, uh, we have, we have sacrificed resilience for efficiency and convenience for a long time. And, and, um, I'm, I'm excited to see people 
asking these questions, having these conversations, and and starting to turn turn local for food production. Well, I think that you know you put it in such an interesting way in terms of you know what it takes to actually create that food that you're consuming requires more energy, requires more calories than what you're getting from it. You know, and then like you're saying, then half of it's wasted. But, you know, the other thing, you know, when we talk about, you know, food security, I mean, people say, okay, I can grow my own tomatoes. I can grow my own artichoke, you know, and that is wonderful. And we talk about supporting the local farmers markets and, you know, whether it be a meat producer, fisherman or or poultry as well, not just vegetables. um, You're 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 investing in the future for that foundation because. You know, if we don't invest in them now, when we do need them, you know, whether it be because of a, a storm or a disruption in the economy or, you know, whatever else can cause, you know, we're, we're talking about trucking shortages and things like that. When we do need them, if they're not there, that's where the real problem lies, right? That's right. A hundred, a hundred percent. And, and even deeper than that, um, it just, just kind of in the, in the natural state of things, there's a really, and I'm going to tie this back into avocados, actually. <laughs> there we go, <laughs> full a, circle. There's a really good um, docu-series on Netflix called Rotten. And there's an avocado episode on there that's, that's specifically, you know, people are interested in understanding the global food system and its challenges. I highly recommend at least watching that episode. The whole series is great. Um, but when you when you look at what happens just in society and with human nature in a centralized um, kind of, kind of um, uh, conglomerated power, right? You've got uh, big, 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 big avocado business. So California, um, in the early days of avocados, California was it, right? But now it's actually, actually Mexico. It's mm-hmm. Michoacan, and that's the whole uh, story that we've seen playing out with the avocado shortages is um, the fact that the avocado farms that provide most of the world's avocados, now Chile is another big avocado producer. They have a whole other set of problems. But, but uh, uh, Michoacan, uh, the money is so big that the avocado cartels are, are actually larger and more violent than a lot of the drug cartels and <laughs> wealthier by far wow. than a lot of the drug cartels. And so you, you start to see these kind of this centralization and the money that, that starts to flow in and, and how that creates wealth disparity and how that creates corruption versus your small local farmer, right? Versus decentralization versus localization where you've got, uh, you know, a, 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 a larger group of people that are local that are earning a good living wage, uh, hopefully, again, if they're being supported by, by local folks buying their produce. And, uh, and, and you just don't get these kind of societal impacts of, of big industrialized, centralized agriculture. You know, it's funny because I hear about these stories, and I don't know, I must be in the wrong area of our industry because I hear about like these stories about these large people that make a lot of money when it comes to farming and plants and, you know, you know, all these, you know, not just vegetable plants, but like, you know, perennial plants and, you know, there's money behind these companies and all this. And I'm like, I, I, I mean, I'm don't see it on my end. So I, I, I must be in the wrong portion of it because, you know, when I, when I see an avocado farmer here in San Diego, I definitely am not envisioning a, uh, a a drug lord farmer. I, I mean, I know plenty of avocado farmers here, and none of them are are driving around with uh, um, you know armored trucks full of cash. I'll tell you that. That's right. So. <laughs> That's right. Well, they're they're competing with avocados uh, grown by nearly slave labor. Yeah, it's true. And that, and so there's you know it's. The, the system's kind of worked itself out in the United States, and, and we're, you know, farmers farmers basically earn uh, government subsidies based on the scale of their operations, and so it's, it's very, very tight. Um, and But then we get these, these long supply lines into Mexico, into places in the world like Borneo, you know, formerly mm-hmm. one of the most biodiverse, one of the densest carbon sinks on the planet, uh, now has been practically eradicated into palm oil fields 
and because there was great soil there from the former rainforest and cheap labor and uh, agriculture was able to, to be stimulated with you know with a, with a very very low cost to set up the operations and and uh, that's why we end up with a 1300 mile average on our, <laughs> our <laughs> distance. Now, now over there at Thrive Lot, you guys do focus on some of the soil um, aspects of it. As you said, permaculture is an important part of what you you all choose to focus on when it comes to creating a design, creating a, a program for people. Um, depending on where people are at, you say you have professionals in those specific regions. Do you recommend any kind of soil testing to go along with this, or how do you guys start that process? Great, great question. The answer, of course, is it depends. Um, very often, now, now the, the folks that we work with today have a significant amount of experience. I do think there is a future in which every Thrive Lot project, there's a, there's a soil sample kit that hits the ground, and there's kind of a, a spot test and a grid pattern around the area that's going to be impacted. But today, today we, we utilize folks who have a lot of experience, and I've been on a lot of these site assessments, and it's amazing to see a local expert walk around your property and point out, you know, specific little, uh, quote-unquote, weeds, you know, specific little plants, specific little colorations in the leaves of something that's growing over here, and, oh, well, that, that means that the soil is this, and that means, well, there's water over here. You may have a, you may have a, a water main leak, leaking or something. You know? yeah. And just, just reading the land and reading the soil. And so most projects actually don't involve uh, soil, soil samples. Now, if there is a historical home that may have had uh, lead paint, then we always want to do soil sample mm. um, before planting food. That is, please. Please, please, please do that. That's okay. critical. And if, if if you're in an area that may have formerly been a, a commercial or industrial property, uh, which a lot of a lot of neighborhoods, you know, one time there was a factory there back in the yeah. 1950s, and and then it got plowed under, and now there's a subdivision. Um, we we want to test that soil, and, and and do keep in mind a lot of subdivisions, a lot of houses. Um, what we're what we're actually going to be doing is building soil on top of the subsoil that's yeah. there. I think so many people get discouraged about gardening because, and, and we have people come to us all the time and say, well, I think what you're doing is great. I wish I could have a, a thriving lot, but you know, I tried to grow tomatoes out here and, and nothing grows on my clay. <laughs> well, it's because you don't have soil. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It's so true. I mean, you know, when, especially in these subdivisions, they come in and they, they either import soil or they scrape it down to the right. non-valuable clay and rock that when people right. go to plant in there, they, they fail and they think it's because they failed. But in reality, it's just the soil had nothing going for it. You know, you could really uh, send a realtor on his uh, <laughs> doing backflips by asking as you look at the house, well, tell me about the soil. What can, what can I, what can I plant? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I, I just, I just hope for a future in which people are asking that. Yeah, I really do. That's, yeah, that's an inspiring vision. Of the future. Yeah, the house is nice. What about the soil? Because I want to grow some plants and maybe some edibles. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think, I think we may, we may see a world in which um, soil is the new black gold. You know, yeah. in in which people that have their own resilient food production set up around them. You know, that's a uh, a point of uh, personal personal wealth in a, in, a, in a real way. I know I think of it in that way, and, and I think other people are starting to. So, Justin, are you are you guys getting busy right now? I mean, it is the it is the start of spring, as we mentioned. You know, California, Florida. Um, uh, you know, we are starting our spring into the warmer states, and we still have a month or so before the other cooler states really begin their part. But for you, yeah. is it getting busy now? A absolutely, we are we are booking up site assessments. We're booking out projects, um, and I'm I'm pretty confident in some areas that within about a month we're going to already be booking things into the fall. Um, there's just a, an intense interest in um, in these types of projects, and and still today, you know, we we hope to change this, but still today, there's not enough local experts in doing this kind of work to truly. To, to truly get it all done. And so um, 
yeah, it's it's busy. Um, we're we're working as hard as we can to uh, try to take care of everyone, but um, um, it's going to be a wild year. Yeah, and as far as um, you know, you guys have been around for a few years, so you're kind of seeing increases in this interest year after year. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, and um, and and the the interesting thing too is that you know. I, I was concerned at the start. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna sell gardens, but people aren't going to understand the ecosystem aspect, right? There's, I think there's this prevalence um, kind of the way it's always been done must be must be the right way. And I know I grew up gardening in the very old school way of killing straight rows and putting in your neat little rows of, of a few things and then fighting for your life for a few <laughs> seasons uh, with, with bugs and, and that, that popped up because we, you know, we scraped off the ecosystem. But, but, uh, but anyways, people in general, I have noticed, are actually coming to us with the environmental bent, with the, I really want to create pollinator habitat. I want to see wildlife. And um, I was really worried when we started that, uh, that people just weren't going to get it. And they were just going to say, yeah, just give me my tomatoes. I don't want anything else around it. Like, well, we need to put some supporting species around it. We want some bacanoid wasps hanging out if, if the tomatoes are going to survive, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 but so far, uh, people have been, have been really receptive and actually seeking out and, and specifically calling out, um, hey, I, I've been looking for someone to help me with this. I get that it's complex. Um, I get that it takes some, some education and some experience. And um, I'm glad you guys are here to help. So, yeah. Very encouraging. And, you know, and then time and patience along with it, because, you know, we know these changes don't uh, happen overnight. And especially being right. in this world of, of plants, you know, patience is always a good thing to have in your back pocket, because if you try to rush it too quick, that's when you do fail and people get discouraged. Yeah. Um, yep, that's yeah. So, um, so uh, anything coming up that uh, you want to tell our listeners about for Thrive? Um, you know, I mean, I I know the website, you know, thrivelot um, dot com, and right. um, you know, there I saw, you know, you guys are on social media there on Facebook posting some different things that you guys are working on, different articles for people to be able to read and get more information. Um, you know, do you guys have any events or anything coming up here in the near future that you want to tell people about? Yeah. So, well, I, I'd say just, just think about, uh, March, March and April, typically the earth months, right? We've got earth day coming up. Um, let's, let's all think about our impact on the world around us. Um, in general, we are buckled down and pushing into spring. We've just opened up a handful of new markets, Seattle, Houston, Dallas, um, I believe a little bit, a little bit of extra territory, Virginia, New York, uh, Philadelphia, um, and and we're opening markets left and right. So so if if we're not where you are, just come onto the website, fill in your information, give us your zip code. The more people we have in the zip code, the sooner it is that we're gonna we're gonna find folks to help you out. And um, uh, we're, we we do have some exciting stories coming out, some exciting news. We've just updated the website. I think the the experience for customers is um, is constantly getting better. That's our our goal. It's a, to, it's, it's continuous improvement. Um, yeah, check out check out the website thrivelot.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and um, and and let's get some food growing outside our doors. Yeah, I agree, Justin. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a um, a great St. Patty's Day this week, and um, good luck to the spring. And hopefully, we'll talk to you again soon. Tiger, John, Brian, thank you so much. You guys have a wonderful week as well. Keep up the great work. Uh, keep tuning in, and uh, appreciate you guys having me back on. All right, take care. You bet. Thank you, Justin. Good information and a lot to a lot to think about. And I guess we have another guest coming up here uh, <laughs> yeah, moment, if you're, momentarily. If you're watching uh, Facebook Live, you guys can see my uh, son Isaac has joined the table here. He's gotten bored of sitting in the background. You want to say hi, Isaac? Hi. <laughs> And look at that. We just had uh, 10 more viewers uh, yeah, boom. tune in. So you, you're a good ratings guy right there. You, <laughs> you're bringing in the viewers and the listenership. Thank you so much. Isaac, If uh, we're going to grow a vegetable this year. What kind of vegetable would you want us to grow? 
Get right up to the microphone yeah. and let us know. What do you want to grow? What do you think? <laughs> What's your favorite? What do you like to eat? You want bananas. Keep... Ba- bananas. Hey, and we have bananas. You're right. So. Bananas, huh? He is a huge banana eater. How about yes. avocados? Probably not, huh? You like avocados? No, no he doesn't like. Yeah. Carrots? You like carrots. Yeah, we're growing carrots. carrots. Yeah. So You're, you're going to have your own show someday? Your own garden show? <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. You know what they say in show business? Never follow kids or pets. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, when, they, once yeah. the act is over. Once the act is over, because yeah. then you'll never be able yeah. to outperform them. No way. <laughs> hey, Kim in uh, Tucson says that she doesn't have any roses blooming yet, but her penstemons are all blooming. Ooh. Attracting a lot of hummingbirds. Pestilence is Pen- growing? Pestilence. <laughs> Penstemon. <laughs> um, you know, I brought in studio, and I'm going to focus on the shot real quick. Uh, these are freesias out of my garden. Um, so freesias, the bulb. I, Which are you gave me a freesia. I did? Maybe. I think yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, so they're in bloom right now at my yard. And, you know, the funny thing, John, I don't know if you've grown freesias, but when I have the individual plants, they the, the flowers are kind of on compact stems. Right. But then I have this one that's growing in, like, a bush. And they actually get really long when they kind of grow through a bush and out on the uh, the ends because then the blooms come out towards the tips. And I'm like, oh, maybe that's the way I get long stem freesias is I got to grow them into a bush and then they'll grow out the, the back of it or something. Well, there's uh, some species of freesias. Like uh, I'm trying to think, is it Lictolinii? Uh-huh. It's a kind of a yellowish freesia that's a species, a little bit smaller flowers but extremely fragrant. Fr- most freesias are fragrant anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that one is extremely fragrant. And then we've talked about the the white freesia that kind of naturalizes here in California, and that's available. Uh, I might still be available at Old House Gardens mm-hmm. online. <laughs> so w- what did you bring in? So I brought in some freesia blooms, but yeah. then since St. Patty's Day is on Thursday, I brought in a shamrock, which is... or oxalis um i don't see any four-leaf clovers on that one though so but you know it's a nice big one and what white flower and you know before the show we were talking about whether there were holidays without a plant associated with it and the only thing that john can come up with was um more uh what would you call them holidays based on historical events not necessarily holidays like a you know, St. Patty's Day is a religious holiday, and Christmas is a religious holiday, and Easter so, so, is a so religious Saint holiday. Patty's Day, you've got the four-leaf clover right. that you're talking about. Christmas, you have the poinsettia. poinsettia. Easter, Easter, I mean, there's just everything. I mean, Easter lilies, tulips, hyacinths, you know, hyacinths yeah. all of that stuff. So you're looking um, for a major holiday that does not have plants or flowers associated with it. Yeah, like, you know, uh, maybe more of a, let's say, a, call it a religious holiday. Because, yeah, I mean, Labor Day, as John mentioned, <laughs> doesn't have too many plants associated with it. And if you can think of any, let us know on Facebook. Yeah. Well, Mother's Day has flowers associated yeah, true. with it. And I said Father's Day. I don't think Father's Day has no, flowers I don't know of a, associated a with it flower. at all. Maybe maybe a good meal someplace. <laughs> Food, Barbecue, maybe, steak. I th- yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. On Mother's Day, I remember uh, working in the garden center back in Michigan that corsages were a big deal for Mother's Day. They used to be, yeah. right? Like you used to buy one for your mom and right. you know, she would corsages on the if, wrist and then if her mother was dead, it was supposed to be white. Uh-huh. And if her mother was still living, it would be a colored corsage, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I remember thinking reading about that when we were talking about Mother's Day before. Veronica says Halloween with a bunch of question marks. Pumpkin. But pumpkin. Pumpkin. Yeah. I mean it's not a flower, I guess, but, but it's it comes a from food. a flower, right? It is a gourd. It is a plant. We celebrate gourds on Halloween, right? Yeah, yeah. And and then the other thing, I did a news spot this week for one of the local TV news stations here, um, and I brought in um, the books. Uh, I thought this was a good time of year. There's a a local woman here named Caitlin Mitchell who created one of the things that schools have a tough time. They they always get funding for school gardens, meaning. Meaning yes. they get the plants, they get the soil, they get the fertilizers, they get the boxes to do. But then it's difficult for teachers because then that's just one more thing for a teacher to do. And so this local woman here in San Diego created a curriculum. It's called Rutabaga Education. 
And um, she created these books for every grade. And it's designed so that way a parent volunteer can come into the classroom and teach the lesson. So the curriculum's right, right there. It's really easy to follow. You can print out uh, worksheets from these books and all the other things. But, but you don't have to be a teacher to teach this. You can just, as long as you can read what is supposed to be said and what's supposed to be done, then you'll be able to do it too. And it takes that, that more burden on the teachers out of mm -hmm. the, the school garden. And kind of like what we're talking with Justin about is, that you, you know, at a young age, we should be teaching our kids where food comes from. Because then they have a better understanding of how the grocery important, store. Yeah, uh, important it is right, sure. and the knowledge to be able to do it. So, you know, uh, yeah, Rutabaga Education. And I'll post a link to her website into the Facebook feed because, um, you know, I think it's an important thing for people to learn and know how to do. And it is part of uh, the uh, STEAM and STEM and all the other um, classifications for education that are required um, on different state and national levels. You looking at Connie's uh, remark, John? Hops for Labor Day? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, good. See, leave it to our viewers. Yeah. I was just thinking on rutabaga education, if she would have been more successful with sweet corn education <laughs> or carrot education. I rutabaga. Think it, I think it was based on um, not having any competition. <laughs> If you type in rutabaga, yeah. you'll be one of the top. <laughs> Did, have you ever had rutabagas? Only in pie. I Maybe. I didn't know it. Uh, somebody snuck it in. <laughs> I've never deliberately, though, sought out rutabaga. The only time I've ever had rutabaga that I recall is my wife is Finnish, and uh, a Finnish meal is pasties. Have you ever had pasties? No. It's kind of like a uh, chicken pot pie, not in a pot. You know, it's a, a pastry filled with vegetables. Is it like shepherd's pie in a way? No, no. It's more like a, um, it's a, it's a flaky okay. pastry. Well, it sounds good. Yeah. You had me at flaky. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it has uh, meat like ground beef, uh, carrots, rutabaga okay. inside of it. And then you put ketchup over it and everything tastes better with yeah, ketchup, Yeah, you put right? ketchup over it to disguise all the flavor. Yeah, but that's the only only time I've ever had rutabaga that I recall. Yeah, I've only had it in pie. What about, but, rhubar what about rhubarb pie? Rhubarb, yeah. I've never heard of rhubarb pie. Or no, maybe I'm no. thinking rhubarb. <laughs> rhubarb <laughs> rhubar yeah. pie. That's rhubarb. what you're thinking of, rhubarb pie. Yeah. yeah rutabaga rutabaga pie would be disgusting. Yeah, it's more of a, yeah, like a... Uh, that would be like, like a beet pie. Beet pie. Well, do you right? think that avocado ice cream Turnip is disgusting? Pie. I don't, I I would try it. I mean, that's supposedly one of Tom Brady's meals. Is yeah, what you he told eats. us that last week. Yeah. Or avocado. garlic ice cream. Garlic ice cream? Yeah. I don't know. I love garlic and onions, but I'm not enough. They have it up in Gilroy when they do their garlic festival. It's kind of weird. They have garlic ice cream. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's not. Yeah, like it sounds horrible, but it's not bad. Gilroy is one of those cities you can smell as you come up to a... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Welcome to Gilroy. Yeah. The city you can you, smell. You, you can smell it before you get to it. Right. Depending on which way the wind's blowing. Gil uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, Chino used to be a city like that. Oh, yeah, and it still is, too. Is and, and Morgan Hill, where um, my wife's family lives, is mushroom capital. And it, they smell, too, but that's because of the importing of the manure for the mushrooms. Right. And then Gilroy right next to it is for the garlic. And then, like you're saying, Chino is because of the cow. Any place that smells like broccoli, you'd smell that a mile away. I have a rose, have been, a found rose, that was found in Morgan Hill. Yeah, right. I remember it's you called Morgan, Morgan Hill Morgan Red. Hill. Yeah. I should give you that for your wife. Yeah, that'd be fun. I think I might have an extra one. Yeah? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, no. It's, yeah, I remember you telling me about that rose before. It was found... At the Rose Garden or the cemetery up there? Oh, I, I don't I know. Thought, oh, I thought you knew. I thought you told. I thought you said that before. But it was just in no, Morgan I'll, Hill that you know of. Right. A, a lot of found roses come from cemeteries, and there's the Sacramento Cemetery that has a lot of a those. Lot. Um, yeah. But I'm not sure of that particular one. Let's see. Carolyn is asking whether Welsh miners, I think she means... ERS instead of ORS, <laughs> um, who migrated to the United States from the UK, introduced pasties to gold miners. Oh. I have no idea. 
Don't know. I do know that that um, those types of pies, meat pies and things like that, in other countries are a big deal. Like yes. when we were in New Zealand, you could go into a gas station and get gas, and there'd be a little pie cabinet there right at the checkout counter that would have warm, warm. meat pies and things mm-hmm. that you, you could buy. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, you know, a sandwich or, you know, a hamburger is basically a thicker breaded pie, right? You know, from the because standpoint. It, because it's round? Well, no, just because, it, you know, a pie, you've got the crust. Okay. And you've got the fillings in it. Mm-hmm. And a sandwich is just basically bread as far as the With crust With your goes. choice of fillings. Yeah. You know, so I I love a good chicken pot pie or oh, some yeah. kind of meat pie. Yes. I think those are delicious. Yeah. So you know, Connie gave a better description of pasties. It's like a big turnover. Oh yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. That that's a much better way of describing it. I should I should cook myself more meat pies. You know, my <laughs> yeah, that's a random train of thought all of a sudden. I should cook myself meat some more pie. meat pie. Yeah. <laughs> Um, my daughter says she homeschools her right. two children, and she said they're working on a unit um, studying farming and food. Perfect. Right now, that's that's you know, something she should look up too. Is that rutabaga? Education. She should. Yeah, they would have good lessons in it. And and nowadays, I mean, if you are homeschooling your your child, there there's so many resources. There's this thing called um, teachers pay teachers where teachers can upload their lessons that they've created and done. And, you know, you can, for, for a, a small fee, you can get access to, you know, the worksheets, the lessons, the layouts, the instructions for all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's just a way for those really creative teachers to have some value to what they've already worked on. But um, it's a great way for other people to get just inspiration on how to do lessons differently and, Right. More right. more fun than maybe what is in their classic textbook. Yeah. Yeah, I don't recall them ever in school talking about uh well, maybe you know where food comes from, farming. They probably well, touched on it a little bit. Well, I feel like there was that point. gap in your guys' generation. Like I think that your generation was taught food from your parents because right. I think I think they right. grew food and no, that we was were, just we were taught how to duck and cover. <laughs> you know, normal. And then there was that gap where parents didn't teach their kids and then the schools didn't teach the kids i grew up in detroit and we had a 40-foot lot was where our house was and we had a a vegetable garden behind the garage yeah and that was probably a standard of practice yeah was that common with your neighbors Yeah. yeah yeah i would say probably on our street i would say probably 80 percent of the houses had gardens but, you know, it wasn't that long after World War II. No, the and Victory Gardens. The Victory Gardens were big back then, sure. and people just carried on. And then plus more immigrants back then. And, you know, uh, my heritage being Italian, uh, a lot of the Italians were farmers growing fresh food. If you go over to Italy today, Brian, you remember how fresh the vegetables were yeah, over there? Yeah, that was the one thing that I do remember. If you that- ate a tomato in Italy, it's like... The first time you've ever had a tomato. This tomato, <laughs> this tomato was picked this morning yeah. on the menu, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. so I think there, there was that gap where, you know, they lost contact with it. And I, I do feel it's coming back. Though. I do feel it, it is coming back where, A, parents are teaching their children about food. I think schools are teaching their the students about food. And it is kind of coming back in an understanding. So I like to see that because I do think we lost it for a while. Well, you know. Food right now is just too cheap. Yeah. And then and with Justin's inflation, argument. if it keeps going up, people will start growing their own right. again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you're backed up against the wall. You have some decisions to make. And it wasn't just, wasn't just uh, picking uh, any type of food for harvesting immediately. A lot of canning was done and preserving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, not so much drying back then, but today a lot more people are drying foods. You know, one thing I noticed, too, about people who live through the Depression is that after a meal, you know, there are certain things that, that you throw away and certain things that you keep. But I was amazed at, at some of the people I came in contact with. You think, well, just toss it away. Oh, no, because I can make this, this, or this out of that. Yeah. Something yeah. that you never would have thought of. But back in the Depression, they had to be very creative. 
right. make and make their food budget and the food stretch. You know, you don't throw it away. You 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 turn it into something else, mm-hmm. or you make this out of that. I think I told you the story that I came home from school one day and I saw a uh, a pot on the stove with boiling <laughs> water and chicken feet sticking out of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. This was when. When I was, I was probably like 12 years old <laughs> or something. Walked into the house and there was chicken feet sticking out right, of a pot. And my mother was making soup and she would eat the, I mean, I wouldn't touch them, but she ate the chicken, chicken feet. feet. Yeah. And, you didn't uh, waste anything, right? Well, she actually got those from the butcher for free. Mm-hmm. But she said that that was one of the things during the Depression that they could get for free because the butcher would just throw them away. Yeah. So they made soups and in different yeah. things out of whatever they yeah. could get. Yeah. You... Kind of, kind of my point that things that you don't think of to to use again can be used because you're not you're not used to it. It's you know? in and then you know it's it's interesting to kind of see what people grow you know for themselves like you know we strawberries are a plant that I will always grow for myself because I just feel Mm -hmm. being able to buying that basket of strawberries is great. I love doing it and I will eat them, but I like being able to go out and pick a strawberry as it's ready. And then it's, you, you get the plants that are kind of coming and going, meaning, Mm -hmm. you know, they're not all ready at once. You're always going to have something kind of, and I like that idea of having a a food crop out there. That's kind of giving, you know, the, the 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 ever bearing strawberries that are just always giving you fruit throughout the season because it's there where I might not always have a strawberry in my refrigerator because I don't always buy them but it is one plant that I always love to have yeah you still have the pine berries yep. right mixed in there yep those are delicious what about blueberries I tried one in one spot and it didn't work didn't go, so I'm going to huh? try again this year you know Ed Livo had told us that. And he sent us pictures about growing blueberries in containers. Mm -hmm. And they grow fantastically well in containers. Hmm. And it was, I think, I'm thinking back to maybe 20 years ago. Maybe it was a little longer than that. There were no blueberries anywhere in Southern California. Yeah. And it wasn't until the development of the Southern high bush that we could grow blueberries here that took warm climates. Right. Uh, Kathy and Neelan mentions that she's got uh, the wind is picking up and they've got a windstorm oh, heading wow. up there. Bummer. And I heard that down here that they're, they were predicting 40 mile an hour winds in some of the inland areas. Really? Here this weekend? Yeah. Yeah. Like starting today. So maybe, maybe closer to the LA area. Hmm. I don't know about down here. Well, sometimes we get residual. Tanya's mentioning how uh, in her part of San Jose, a lot of the yards had short fences along the back, and they had uh, orchards and gardens Mm. that they would grow. And I'm thinking um, of when we were in England, I I don't know if maybe they do it in some of the urban areas here now, but they used to have allotments. And they were still pretty popular when we were in England, and they would have yeah. all their houses would be connected, right? So there were no yards. But behind that or across the street would be an allotment where everyone could grow mm-hmm. their own vegetables. Yeah. Yeah, it's still a very common thing to do. It, it's funny she mentions the short fences because that was one of the things in the Midwest. I, Whenever I visited, I'm still blown away that there's no fences. Right. And everybody just shares yards. <laughs> like like everybody just shares their yard. How about and, when you fly over the and, Midwest and, and you look down and it's just all the same, all these lots? Yes. Yeah. That always just kind of blew my mind. And and then if you have a fence, it's your neighbors judge you because they feel like you're keeping a secret. Yeah, what do you or got something. what do you got going on that fan? Why you get that fence yeah. up? What are you doing? It depends where you are in the Midwest. Yeah. In the yeah. cities there's fences. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we always went by the was it Robert Frost that had the uh, quote in a poem about uh, good fences make good neighbors? Oh, no. Uh, yes. Was it Robert Frost? I don't know. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> that could be one of your quotes. Uh, cook rutabaga like a turnip mashed with butter and honey. So yum, like a potato? Yum. That's from Jim, Jimmy. So, so kind of like a potato maybe then, huh? Rutabaga kind of like a potato? Well, do you think a turnip's like a potato? No, but he well, says mashed. Well, he, you mash, but he's saying you can mash he turnips, He said like a too. turnip mashed with butter and honey. Yeah. 
So you're gonna mash a turnip? You, you had me at butter and honey. Yeah, that's good enough. Yeah, you know? butter and honey. Ooh, that's interesting too. Oh yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Robert sweet. Frost. And what was the exact quote? Was it exactly good, as good we said? Good fences make good, good neighbors. neighbors yeah. Right. It's from a poem called "Mending Wall." Oh, I thought you were gonna say "Mending Fences." <laughs> For the for for the people listening on Facebook Live too, uh, this is an interesting show. It's something you know. It's different for us. I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we haven't taken one N- just the pause. one break to get our guest on because we are not recording this week for Biz yeah. Talk Radio because of a technical issue, which I need to deal with after the show. It's been straight through the whole time, but it doesn't even allow me to collect my thoughts. Also, I know those and like breaks, regroup. It, it's amazing that those little breaks, even if they're 10, 15 seconds, twenty yeah. seconds. They do a lot to refresh you. Like, I was going to ask you during the break to talk to Justin when he first was on. About because the Because his audio. I was, I was go- like, ask him if he's on speakerphone or right. not. But then we never s- had a break. Yeah, I was going to say, hey, next break, I'm going to go back and say, can you get on the phone? Can yeah. you get off the speaker? But we had him on, and we, we couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. So, And I just realized that when we came back from getting him on the air, I'm like, we're not recording. There's no reason to follow the format. <laughs> There's no script to follow. We're going to just wing it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a little bit of an interesting flow in the show today. See what Carla said about uh, blueberries, John? I'm, re- I'm just reading it. Yeah. I guess I re- was reading it to myself rather than out loud. Out loud. <laughs> but she, she mentioned it's easier to control the growing environment mm-hmm. because even though the southern high bush are more adapted to our conditions, they still want acid soils. So it's much easier to acidify soils and containers. Yeah, I mean, I agree that I think blueberries, because like I said, I was not successful. I've tried blueberries a couple of times, and I've never been really successful with them in the, in the ground. That maybe this year I'll try it in a pot and see where I go from there. Carolyn says that her husband was from Connecticut, so they had uh, rutabagas prepared, I guess, the way that uh, Jimmy was talking about. For Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah. And then, but in being in California, she's never seen one. And then Connie asked, is this going to be recorded later in Facebook? And yes, all of our Facebook broadcasts are recorded and put onto our Facebook channel and then YouTube channels right. as well for later replay. Right. So fa- Facebook, it's being recorded right now. So yeah. after the show, it's going to always be there. And then yeah. we have our, our YouTube uh, channel, uh, Garden America Radio Show as well, which our IT guy, Daniel, will upload sometime this afternoon. So yep. either place is good. And uh, the, the, the best thing about YouTube is the fact that the, he does all the editing. Yeah. So there's, you don't see us prior to the show getting ready. It starts right off with, good morning, here we are. <laughs> On Facebook, you have to maybe, can you, can, can you, yeah, you, can you, you fast, fast forward? forward. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. But you will see us prior to the show on Facebook, where on, on YouTube you won't. The show starts immediately. A little cleaner. A little bit cleaner, yes. And then, of course, I package the audio of the show every week except this week and send it to BizTalk Radio for the network so those people can hear the show a week after. Why is this week any different? Then, then what? He recording his, the show. He doesn't have because his recording Because we have a technical tool. problem in recording the show, uh, yeah. which I have to deal with after this. John, John's still trying to figure out how to get us live right now. John's still enamored with the World Wide Web. <laughs> I'm still hearing people in commercials. Just visit www. It's like you don't you don't need that. You know what's funny is um, John mentioned blueberries, and our guest next week um, is I don't know who it is specifically yet, but we're talking to a berry producer, specifically blueberries. Um, I found a producer of uh, different blueberry bushes online, and I'm trying to line up the guest to kind of focus on berries. You know, whether it be blueberries and then raspberries, blackberries, the because like Fall Creek Farms. I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. Um, because I thought it was a perfect time to kind of have this discussion because I think most people are planting them now. Blueberries, raspberries. Um, getting them into it. And like John mentioned, not just blueberries, but even like, you know, the blackberry and raspberry, uh, um, red well, berries. They have they, that whole new program yeah, about container. Container uh, ones right. where, you know, you know, people used to talk about blackberries. Nobody wanted a blackberry bush in the past. Yeah. They were horrible plants. <laughs> you know, they Thorny, yeah, right. Wrangly, like you right. used to hate to trim them, and you know, and then you'd have to go pick the fruit, which was wonderful, but you'd get a 
lose a pint of blood in the process of picking fruit. Well, raspberries, <laughs> now they've got raspberry shortcake, right? Uh -huh. That's yep. the dwarf mm -hmm. one for a container. Yeah. And there there are dwarf blackberries yeah. and, and the blueberries. And that's that's the awesome part because berries are another, you know, we talk about food security. They're they're an excellent thing to grow. You know, they, mm -hmm. they taste great. Right. You can go sweet, you can go sour, you can go savory. Um I like the big ones. The like just large like the size of a nickel, you know, <laughs> maybe even a quarter sometimes. Yeah. Like um, it's gotta it be worth it's gotta be worth eating. One. I really like those. I don't know why. Yeah. Connie mentioned parsnips too, as long as we were talking about <laughs> wearing vegetables. I've heard of that parsnips in years. I um I was surprised when we went to the Chelsea Flower Show. There was uh parsnips on display. Really? That were three feet long. What? And I was thinking, how do you get a three foot long parsnip? And they said yeah. they grew them in tubes. Oh, you know, with really oh, soft I see. soil, so they, yeah. they forced them to. They kind of forced them. to grow that way. Yeah. yeah, well, they could grow unimpeded right. down that tube, and you'd have this. Um, I don't think we do well with parsnips in California because, as I recall, they like a little bit of frost. Yeah, yeah. for their best of, flavor. Yeah, they're one of those. They like the cool. Yeah, and we just get warm too quick. Yeah, you know, there's those series of vegetables that like it cool longer. Yeah. Yeah, and there's some yeah. berries like that too. We we can't grow gooseberries in Southern California. <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's was one of the problems with the blueberry is they liked it cool too. Um, but you know, and we just grow them too long. <laughs> <laughs> Connie mentioned that her her grandma would try to uh, sneak in salsify. <laughs> what is that? Or salsify. It's um, they call it vegetable oyster. Uh huh. It was. Uh, because it has once it's cooked, it has kind of a slimy uh, really? oyster. Really? Yeah, why would yeah, you want to even yeah. sneak it in? Well, that's why you sneak it. But why would you, what benefit is there? Well, there's gotcha. <laughs> there's those uh, really unusual vegetables that some, occasionally you'll see in the supermarket. And it's like, yeah. who what is would this? buy that? Like, yeah, what is this? Like celeriac. Who buys celeriac? <laughs> or kohlrabi? Like something you take for a kohlrabi, yeah. yeah. Take celeriac and go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> taste celeriac and go to it's bed. Like, it's like something you take if you have My a My wife a has medical, medical problems. She's a celeriac. Yeah. <laughs> celeriac. And then, but then there's those, because I was thinking it was maybe something like, um, you know, with, with pinto beans, they put in, um, is it episote? They usually add yeah. that to pinto beans right. and it's supposed to kind of take the gas out of it or something, right. you know, as far as like, so I didn't know if it was one of those additives that did something to the fruit, um, where you would never eat episote probably elsewhere, you know, like you would never try to incorporate that into episote. a salad or anything. <laughs> See, I feel that way about cilantro. <laughs> See, you're so wrong. See, I love cilantro, cilantro is delicious. Huh? Cilantro and onions are, are oh the, man. In a bean and cheese burrito. Yeah. I don't care what else you do to it. I need cilantro's and I'd like grilled onions Ooh, in that bean and cheese onions. burrito. Grilled onions. Yes. Cilantro is uh, one of those vegetable or one of those herbs you take sides on. Yeah. And there's yeah. nobody yeah. that says I can take it or leave it. You know it. the best cilantro I ever had? You either love it or, or hate it. was the cilantro that I grew in that veggie pod. Oh, I'm sure. And when I first tasted that, I said yeah. to my wife, Dana, I said, gosh, taste this. This is unbelievable. You have a perfect spot for growing cilantro, too, because oh. it's cool and mm -hmm. shady. Yep. You know. In San Diego, when we grow cilantro in full sun, it it bolts too quickly, and then the flower changes the flavor. Mm -hmm. and yeah, there was something about it was like this is a little. It's cilantro, but it's got just a little different taste. Yeah, it was wonderful. And well, then, guys, we're you we're toward the uh, yeah end of the show here. This is usually when we begin to bail out uh, of Biz Talk Radio and Facebook Live. Anything else we want to talk about? You mentioned next week, Tiger. We've got yeah, we'll be uh, talking berries. Berries. Yeah, we'll be talking berries. So we'll be talking about blueberries, raspberries, different varieties that are easier to grow, easier to manage. But then at the same time, as John mentioned, produce still very, very well. Right. So right. because you know you you still want the production even if you are growing it into a. Pot. So things are happening. Spring in. Uh, when's the, spring is officially here? When, John? Mm. You're the calendar guy. Yeah. It's spring, usually the twentieth. Twentieth. Right? Yeah, right around there. And of course, daylight savings time kicks off tonight. Yeah. So, so if you oh, wake up, lose. if you don't set your clocks ahead, you're going to wake up tomorrow at seven o'clock, and it's really going to be eight o'clock. So tomorrow, when I wake up, I normally wake up between like 
five and six. It'll be between six and seven. Yeah, it's going to be an hour later. But they give you that one day to get used to before you go back to work. That's nice. Like that's going to help. You know, one day. <laughs> oh, I'm so refreshed. <laughs> they they recommend that to help compensate for the time change to go to bed 15 minutes early or wake up 15 minutes late. 15 minutes, really? That's all? That's what they say. I never trusted but they. They're never wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to join the they group yeah. and you could be one of those people that say those things. Right? Uh, well, I'm part of the they group. Who's to say you're not? You know what they say? They. <laughs> yeah. What else, John? Lisa says she loves us. And we love her, too. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Love you. Yeah, it's a little more free wheeling without the uh, worrying about staying on network time. Yeah. Without the format. It's Connie more... mentions to change the time in your cars, too. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And yeah. I have an older car, and that's just not easy for me to do. Really? Well, you have a sundial in your car, right? That's how old <laughs> it is. <laughs> Do you remember the clocks in, in the older cars? They were never right. Never? That never. is so never. true. And on the VCR, is never set. I grew up thinking that clocks in cars were like, eh, they're just there, but they never work. Yeah. Or if they work, they, they peter out in a month. Yeah. They would never work. You're right. They would never work. Yeah. Now everything's yeah. digital now. The VCR was always just blinking. Blinking midnight. Yep. Because nobody knew how to never set it. Set it. <laughs> I remember the first time a friend of mine got a VCR back in the early 80s. I'm like, well, this means you can watch a movie anytime you want to. Yeah. But there weren't that many movies out yet. Right. But the whole concept that you could put it in, pause it, rewind, fast forward, it's like, boom, head exploded. <laughs> hey, Carla wants you to remember to start the show an hour later next week. <laughs> Thank you. See, I wouldn't, yeah. have, I wouldn't have remembered. So we're going to start the show one hour later. Especially if you don't later. change your clock. Yeah. We're going to start things off one hour later next week. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening to our guest, Justin, talking about sustainable food, avocados. Blueberries again, next week. Yeah. Did you say blueberry or blueberry? Blueberries. Okay, not blueberry like the cereal. No, no. Okay. Blueberries. Blueberries. It's going to be a very good time next weekend. For the entire crew, I'm Brian Main, Tiger Pelafox, John Bagnesco, Isaac, who has been in studio with us. Thank you for dropping by. Have a safe weekend. Have a safe week, and we'll do it again next week right here, 806 on the West Coast, 1106 Eastern Time Zone here on Garden America. Take care. Bye-bye.